Today is Thursday, December the 5th, 2019, and the location of the interview is at the American Red Cross chapter in Kennewick, Washington. Uh, I am interviewing Art Moore, a veteran leaving the service as an E-5. Uh, Art was born March 4th, 1947. Dixie Ferguson and Vic Phillips, the videographer, are conducting the interview today. We represent the Blue Mountain chapter of the American Red Cross in Walla Walla, Washington. So, uh, Art, once again, uh, what war and branch of service did you serve? Well, I served in the U.S. Navy, and uh, I served from 1966 through 1970. Uh, I spent a year on Kodiak Island in Alaska after all the basic training. And then I came back and uh, was trained uh, for combat in uh, Port Wyneme, California, and then sent to Vietnam up in the I Corps right on the demilitarized zone but, uh, night from actually uh, March, uh, uh, April, the night, eight, April the 20th, 1968, through the 19th of April. Uh, 1969. Some things you never forget. One day short <laughs> of a full year. We'll get into all those details. Good. Yes. <laughs> all right. Uh, were you drafted or did you enlist? Well, the draft was uh, breathing down pretty heavy, so I thought I would avoid Vietnam and join the U.S. Navy. It didn't work out. <laughs> I ended up being a part of the Navy Seabees and their primary investment of effort and time was in Vietnam. Good timing. <laughs> and uh, where were you living at the time? Oh my goodness, at, at the time I joined I was Bakersfield, California where I was born, actually born in Oildale, California which is North Bakersfield and uh, I had graduated from high school and I drove a school bus for a half a year. I enrolled in junior college and I promptly uh, 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 dropped all my classes and joined all the clubs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> were you watching on the horizon, the horizon, the news going on? Absolutely. And you knew? Yes, you we were. all knew. It was heavy in the air. Yes, uh-huh. And uh, I'm just curious, uh, a lot of your, or some high school classmates of yours also joined, drafted at the same time? I actually uh, joined with two of my best friends that I grew up with, and of course uh, the high school, we had a number of casualties of course, I had a large class, over 900 in my graduating class, and uh, we lost uh, quite a number with that, that many, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, I'm curious what your parents, uh, they kind of knew what was going to happen also, and then when, when you actually were inducted, got the letter, whatever, their mm -hmm. reaction was? Good question. Uh, Mom and Dad, uh, my dad was blind, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Mom was working uh, at a minimum wage job, and uh, they, they knew that the draft was threatening uh, probably our having to be on the ground uh, uh, with guns going through the jungle. And when I decided that uh, I would join the Navy, that uh, provided a little bit of relief for them temporarily. And uh, they were very supportive. Mm -hmm. Right, patriotic. Yes, very. Mm -hmm. Was your bl uh, father blind from uh, birth? My dad had uh, retinitis pigmentosis, which is RP, and uh, he worked, uh, he, he uh, spent three months in the Army in World War II until they discovered his eyesight was not going to allow him to stay in. They gave him an honorable discharge, which served him very well years later. And uh, uh, he worked at Richfield Oil Corporation, uh, for many years, he was a human calculator. He could remember statistics and and values like no one I've ever. And the fruit did not fall close to the tree on that with Dad. But then in 1959, he had uh, contracted tuberculosis again, and he went back up to the tuberculosis sanitarium where my mother met him when they were patients in the 1940s. He spent a year, and by the time he got back. 
uh, his eyesight had failed him totally. And, uh, totally? Yes. Yeah, wow. Uh, would you name your parents? Yes. Uh -huh. My dad is Arthur Allen Moore Jr. I am the third. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mom is Constance Eileen Bryant, then Moore. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are my mom and daddy. Excellent. Uh, siblings? I had one sister. Uh, sadly, she uh, died about 15 years ago of uh, malignant melanoma, melanoma brain tumor. She was a school teacher. My goodness, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, sounds like you had a, one, uh, a wonderful family. Great family. Sounds like yeah. it, yeah. So, uh, when did you report for duty and where did you go? Well, uh, Danny Clark and Daryl Omgren, uh, we were uh, threesome. I have a picture of the three of us standing in front of the Greyhound bus terminal in Bakersfield as we shipped off to boot camp in San Diego, California in the uh, early spring of 1966. And uh, we went down to San Diego and went through the Navy boot, ca boot camp in San Diego. Uh, at the Naval Training Center? At the Naval Training Center, yes. Okay. How long were you there? Uh, I believe we were there only about two, two and a half months in basic training. And then uh, I had scored high enough that they allowed me to pick what uh, rating I wanted to be. And uh, someone came through and said, we have the Navy Seabees. They get blue stripes instead of white stripes, and they're an elite part of the U.S. Navy. And uh, would you like to be a part of this group that really you will not even have to be on a ship, quite likely? And, uh, and uh, without knowing the detail, I said, sign me up. <laughs> but the alternative to a ship is land. As land, yes. Okay. <laughs> I have not connected the dots yet. <laughs> Did you even know what a CB was? Yes, I knew what they were, the construction battalion, and they uh, primarily support the M Marine Corps, train with the Marine Corps, and uh, uh, do construction. Uh, they've, of course, started in World War II, did, uh, had high casualty rate because often they were first in, and uh, did all the airstrips and uh, all the supporting infrastructure for the and Marines. And if I might add to yeah. that, uh, they are unsung heroes that are not well known what they do. What you yes, do. yes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so uh, can you kind of describe <coughs> like early on in training? Were you liking it? Oh, I hated it. Uh, I, I remember the first morning in boot camp, uh, getting up and uh, to the sound of the bosun's mate who was in charge of us throwing a garbage can down through the barracks to wake us up. And uh, I hadn't been there but a few hours to realize that I had probably signed away four years of my life that wasn't going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> well, that's a, uh, and it was foggy in San Diego and it was uh, really still cool and uh, uh, I was glad to be there still hoping that I would be uh, exempted from Vietnam but uh, it, it was tough. I remember one thing there that I'd like to say. Sure. Uh, in the uh, boot camp, uh, we marched a lot, drilled a lot, and I remember one time we would uh, be busted for the slightest infractions. If they found one whisker on your face, you know, they would say, Have, you haven't shaved in six months, you know, and they would get right in your face. And one time I did something and they said, Moore, you are going to be the company satellite. And as we marched across that grinder, they made me run around while they were marching, yelling, beep, 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 beep. And uh, I was the company satellite that day. Others did it later, but I don't know what I did to uh, deserve it. Never knew. No. Uh, do you have any idea how they think of these things? No clue. <laughs> <laughs> They're very creative. Yes. Yes, so... Uh, well, you got a lot of extra exercise with that. Yes. That and, very, uh, and whatever you did, right. you'll never know. Right. So anyway, we, we survived. Know, so, <laughs> so marching, marching right along. Uh, food pretty decent. Food was okay. I just remember being extremely tired. Sleep deprivation. I think that was part of the program. 
I remember at times when they'd give you a 10 minute break, you'd lay down on the concrete and go deep sleep for eight minutes. And uh, I just remember being extremely tired. <laughs> yeah, uh, good training. Good training, excellent training, good discipline. And I think it all uh, prepares you for later in life. And uh, uh, though I didn't like it, it was probably good for me. Mm -hmm. How old were you? I was 18. 18. Uh, so your next assignment, next training? Next assignment after that, uh, I, uh, they, a lot of them went straight to Vietnam. Uh, but they assigned me to the uh, Naval Air Station in on Kodiak, Alaska. So I felt like I drew a good duty station. Some of them were clear out on ADAC. At least Kodiak had a uh, civilian town, and uh, I liked that. And, Did they uh, have a 7-Eleven there? They had no 7-Elevens, but they, uh, they, had a, they had real people rather than just military, and it was refreshing to get off base and to to experience that. And you were there for how long and what did you do? I was there one year. I was assigned to the uh, base maintenance, of course, and the motor pool. And uh, we did uh, uh, maintain any, anything from sewers to hot roofs to taking uh, uh, asbestos <laughs> out of uh, attics. And, uh, Good training. And I had a little, I was a sign painter. I could had a lot of artistic ability. I remember being forced, uh, they put me up on the side of a hangar. In fact, that hangar is still there and that sign is still there off these years. There was a sign about eight feet tall and about 40 feet long that I, on a scaffolding in cold weather with all the rough texture and everything, I spent almost a month painting a simple sign that said, beware of props and propellers. And uh, it was a tough assignment because the the it was not smooth and it was cold and uh, but it's still there and you uh, to this day I'm sure it's been repainted but uh, what was the lowest temperature that you experienced there oh I can't remember it being <laughs> too much worse than right here in the Tri-Cities uh, uh, I'm sure it got down to zero or a little below a time or two but we we were young we would go out ice skating we would get uh, snowmobiles and tow each other on ice skates out on the lakes. It was a good year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you know, did you, you felt the looming, though, of Vietnam? I assumed that uh, that would be the next assignment after, after, we le after I left Kodiak. All right. uh, now, a family took me in that went to the church there. And so I stayed with the... Uh, uh, Gerald and Virginia Pitts family who just took me under their sh I'm still indebted to them for keeping my sanity but they brought a lot of servicemen into their house and I don't know how they did it but sometimes there'd be eight or ten of us sleeping in their little tiny house just to get away from the base. Yeah, but you're saying off duty uh, that would do this? Uh, that way in the evening yeah. we'd go into town and stay at their house. My goodness, wow, what a and they would feed us and all, oh, Vernon Jean, she's still alive and still in Portland and uh, gracious, wonderful, amazing, make me cry yeah. people. And tell me their names again. Uh, Gerald and Verna Jean Pitts yeah. and they live, uh, she lives in Grisham, uh, uh, Oregon. Wow, fabulous. Fabulous, fabulous. love the military. What patriots. Yes. Well, that time came and you got your notice. Yes. And uh, what did the notice say? Well, I was uh, assigned to the uh, uh, CBMU Construction, uh, Construction okay. Battalion Maintenance Unit 301 that was permanently assigned to Vietnam. Uh, a lot of the MCBs, the rotor MCBs. Uh, the um, the maintenance construction battalions, which mostly the CBs were made up of, they took the whole group, went in for nine months or so and came out, then went back in with their whole unit, moving equipment and everything back in and back out. My unit was permanently there and people rotated in and out. Uh, mostly we spent one year there and then they still stayed after you left 
and uh, we, uh, but anyway, I uh, got the orders uh, for that maintenance unit. There had not been one since World War II. This was the first established since World, World War II. And uh, so uh, the orders were to report to Port Wyneme, which is a big CB base until this day in California, and went through combat training and uh, all of the preparatory training for Vietnam there. So from Alaska to Port Wyneme? Yes. Uh -huh. How long was that uh, at Port Wyneme? Uh, I believe that was uh, about three months. Can you describe what, like on a daily, what were you learning? What was your training all about, combat training? Well, we, we did a lot in conjunction with the Marine Corps, too, and uh, we did all the rifle training, uh, learning how to fire uh, M16s to grenade launchers, uh, then survival uh, teaching, a lot of classroom work, um, how uh, if you get isolated, how you get back into camp. They're going to ask you who won the World Series of the year before, <laughs> which I would have flunked and I'd have never got back in. That would be very important. <laughs> I'd have never got back in. <laughs> but uh, a lot of it was survival training and uh, and then uh, uh, training on what we were actually doing in Vietnam in regard to construction. Oh. Did you actually learn construction equipment? No, I, I left out a part. When I got out of boot camp, I spent four months uh, at Port Wyneme going through builder training and construction training. Okay. The final touching off was... Oh, right. Okay. So, off to Vietnam. And how did you get over there? Oh, I flew. <laughs> <laughs> No, we, uh, we flew out of Norton Air Force Base uh, in Southern California, and it was a charter flight on Continental Airways, if I remember correctly. And, uh, of course, I remember that day vividly because my wife, uh, uh, looking out at them on the tarmac, and uh, this was before 9-11, they could come right out to the airplane. And it was a very, very... Uh, emotional day. I had only been married uh, a couple months. Oh I'd been my. and uh, oh my. and uh, yeah. so off we went. Oh my yeah. Uh, oh my yeah. Yeah that's some of a movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah saying goodbye. Mm -hmm. uh, so you land where? We landed in Da Nang and uh, I, if I remember right we spent one maybe two days there uh, in Da Nang before they loaded us on a C-123 and flew us up to the demilitarized zone and uh, if you want to hear that uh, Well I'd like to okay. know your first impression of Oh Vietnam. my goodness <coughs> Oh that's good I've written letters I, I wrote uh, about 121 letters home so I have that was very well documented but my feelings over all these years uh, would be that I can't believe that I'm here. I can't believe I am where people are getting killed. I can't believe that I'm in a war. And how is this year going to go? What am I going to see? What am I going to encounter? Uh, uh, will I survive? Will I survive? And, and the sights and smells. Oh my gosh. Well, Da Nang's quite different than the rest. That was pretty civilized, and that was where they would send us for rest and relaxation, R&R, &R, to get us out of where we were at. Uh, but, uh, of course, in any uh, world area other than the United States, the smells are all different, and even the food is different. But uh, you're acclimating to all of these new smells, good and bad, and uh, I could, you knew you were definitely not home. Exactly. Uh, the, uh, the heat factor was the heat uh, It was, but not when I arrived. Uh, I got there again uh, uh, April the uh, 20th, uh, 1968. And uh, it was not warm yet, and I don't remember it being a problem at that point. 
So are you were only in Da Nang for a few days, and then the 123 took you out. But they flew us on a C-123 up to the uh, I Corps, right on the demilitarized zone, to uh, Dong Ha Forward Combat Base, Marine Base, all of that northern northern area. Uh, the Marine Corps was up there, and we were there to support them. I remember the C-123 coming in, and uh, of course you're you're afraid. And anybody says that they weren't afraid, or they're, uh, they're not probably being they were not like I was. Uh, we went in at such a steep descent, and this was onto uh, a, a matted runway, a short matted runway with the metal that had been built by the CBs. And I mean, we were going down so steep, I thought we were crashing mm. coming in. But they pulled up, engines roaring, threw us out, and took off again because they couldn't stay on the ground because of the mortar fire and becoming a target. And uh, so, so we were pushed out the back, and they were gone. Yeah. Uh, okay, then the next few days settling in, define, can you just Well, yes. Uh, again, you're you're just completely disoriented on everything. And, uh, <laughs> Was there a full load, a full load of uh, military in that plane? Uh, yes, uh, coming up. Uh, maybe about 20, 25 of us. But not all Seabees. It was mostly Marine Corps. And so our uh, little uh, camp was right on the perimeter, south perimeter of that uh, base. It was called Camp Spillman. It was named after one of our CBs we had lost in that unit, uh, I think just a few months before I had arrived. And uh, the smells are different. In Vietnam, I guess everybody's got to say it, but the outhouses, they, they used half of 55 gallon drums and diesel oil to set under the holes. And the smells in the morning are always the smell of that, of that diesel burning. Uh, and uh, clogging the air and uh, I was put into a hooch that had slip trenches underneath and trap doors just made out of plywood because the area that we were assigned out there where our camp was was known as Frag Valley and appropriately named because of the often mortar fire and rocket fire that we were at the receiving end of. And uh, so the biggest problem in the first few days is trying to determine in your mind the difference between the sounds of what is going out and what is coming in. And around our perimeter we had tanks and everything on earth that would fire all night long. I mean just rattle your teeth. And uh, you're, you could not determine what was going out or what was coming in. But in time, you were able to sleep solid through the fire going out, which was considerable, and the second a round would come in, you would be immediately awake and immediately trying to preserve your own life of jumping down into the trench and avoid... You didn't need anybody to tell you. Well, in a, uh, within a week or two, that you're, you're, it's amazing what the human mind can do to sift out what is danger and what is not danger. Mm -hmm. That's so true. Yeah. And the, the trench is right around the tent. Uh, tent they were right... Uh, they, the they, no, they were plywood hooches. They were probably about 20 feet wide and 40 feet long. Ten, just corrugated tin roof and screening uh, around the top. And we had dug trenches underneath each one. The, the soil was solid up there, so you could dig deep trenches down. So we had plywood covers that we'd leave a jar at night because, uh, and there was a ladder going down, <laughs> but I can never remember using the ladder. <laughs> no time for ladders. You, you would free fall to the bottom. <laughs> well, how long did it take for, unfortunately, for that to happen? Well, that's a good question, and I learned something myself that I had not known before until I went back and, and looked at this. But uh, uh, I had been there, I got there on April the 19th, or, uh, April the 20th, excuse me, and just a few, at the end of April, 
for three days, April, the last day of April, first two days of May, was the Battle of Dong Ha. And uh, the write-up on that, that I had not even looked at the detail to this past week, but for three days beginning uh, at that point, uh, the Marine Corps up there, a bat small battalion that we had, fought what was arguably the most tenacious and difficult, significant battle of the Vietnam War there in Dong Ha. The stakes were extremely high, the odds against them were even higher. They were outnumbered 15 to 1. Somehow 8 to 10,000 of the North Vietnamese had surrounded us and were prepared to overrun uh, the, the uh, combat base that we were on there. And this was the main logistical uh, outlet for all units in the Northern I Corps where we were at. And, uh, but uh, the writer here said failure to defeat the NVA uh, would open a direct corridor to Dong Ha with no combat infantry to stand in their way. The 3rd Marine Division, which we were supporting, was committed elsewhere, but, uh, uh, but it left Dong Ha exposed because they just had a few people left there. Uh, but failure to win this battle was not an option. The entire war effort was in jeopardy of being uh, compromise if Dong Ha fell and would result in a major strategic and political victory for the oh. North, Vietnamese, no, North Vietnamese Army. Mm -hmm. Not only were these heroes fighting against insurmountable odds, outnumbered 15 to 1, they were directed by higher headquarters to be quote belly to belly with the NVA oh. to keep the pressure on. Uh, long story short, uh, we lost about 500 men. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh my word! How for uh, what uh, 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 but, time frame? Uh, over three days. Over, the Americans lost five hundred men right, in three days. Right, and and then uh, uh, the statistics that I'm reading here uh, out of that eight to ten thousand uh, North Vietnamese, they lost about three thousand, and uh, that happened. Uh, right on the outskirts of where we were at there. We, they did not penetrate our perimeter. Where were you physically when all this is going on? Well, I was on the, the main combat base there at Dong Ha, but I wrote a letter home and uh, uh, that has survived. And it says uh, on May 5th they received it. But uh, dear mom and dad and my sister Norma, uh, at 7 p.m. and and here in Vietnam at 4 a.m. in Bakersfield. Mm -hmm. It is Sunday evening here, the end of a, a day, and it sure did not feel like a day of worship. It was Sunday. Mm -hmm. I had a perimeter watch last night from 12 midnight to 4 a.m. About 3 a.m. I saw uh, uh, five bursts of Viet Cong rocket fire toward our base. and. Uh, they hit one of our fuel dumps, uh, but all hell has broken loose uh, uh, around us. And of course that went on for about uh, three days. But uh, again, the threat did not penetrate the perimeter and the, the, our small group of Marines held them outside. They held them? They yes. held them? Yes. And how many NVA do you think altogether there could They have been predict done? eight to ten thousand had infiltrated the area across the demilitarized zone. I, I have to ask you, what was your state of mind this whole time? I didn't know this was going on. I had no clue. All I knew was that something big was happening. And I, technically, I had not even read the detail on this to just this past week. Really? <laughs> Maybe it was just as well. Just as well, right. Okay, so they held the perimeter. What happened to all of those NVs? <coughs> did, they, did they withdraw back? They, the they went back across to the demilitarized zone, the, those that survived it, yes. And, and they were flying in support uh, into our base to give them help as fast as they could. Uh, jets? Uh, oh, yeah. Jets. Oh, we had, we of course, we're dropping napalm, we're dropping anything and everything. Uh, we even had uh, 
which was quite frequent in Vietnam, and your other that you've interviewed have mentioned the AC-47 gunship that we called Spooky. And it was really a comfort to have Spooky because they would fly around your perimeter and they had General Electric miniguns that fired so many rounds per minute that the guns would just go hum and flying over a football field they would put a bullet in every square foot I'm told and uh, so that was just a, and then every seventh round was a tracer I have pictures of this that uh, just a sheet of fire going around your perimeter and it was always welcome <laughs> yeah, you bet. You bet. Uh, you you did say this was about a three day battle. That was that was a, the Battle of Dong Ha was a three day battle. Last day of April, okay. first two days of and May. And you know what? In honor of these brave Marines, uh, this is a tough question to ask. Hmm. How in the world did you retrieve five hundred? Marines. Well, again, uh, that was not my responsibility. However, uh, in Dong Ha, uh, part of my assignment there uh, was down in Qua Viet, right out on the ocean. But I was called back to Dong Ha with my crew to repair uh, the medical facility there that had shrapnel and rocket damage on it, and the roof needed and trusses needed repair, so I brought my, uh, this was later on in another incident, but we came back to uh, uh, Delta Medical, and they were busy bringing casualties in from Quezon, from everywhere, because it was the closest place to fly them for triage. And I remember clearly with my crew repairing the trusses and the corrugated iron while they were literally sawing off legs and arms underneath us and uh, and it was right next to it's okay just take your time Art <clears throat> it was right next to Gray's registration and uh, while we worked and everybody was being brought in and everything on earth, I, I just remember so clearly seeing wedding rings. Yeah, it's a tough story. Thinking they don't even know at home. Tough story. So, it, uh, you know, it's war. And uh, I'm more emotional now <laughs> than I was then. At that point, you have to you, you have to be tough, and and uh, and the reflection of it is very emotional. But there, we just did it because we had to do it. I'm assuming though, just the adrenaline was just yes. Yeah. Just so the one job assignment we had was to repair a Delta Medical that, and uh, while they were still. They, they couldn't shut it down. They had to continue to work. Uh, so there were nurses, this is like a field hospital, it, nurses, doctors? Yes, there. nurses, doctors, and it's just plywood. It's a, it's maybe 6,000 square feet or something like that, all corrugated iron and like everything was built of over there, just plywood studs and corrugated iron. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so you were called out wherever, whenever? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's another good story. I I was a I, and still am, but I I was a real, committed, Christian believer, and it wasn't a foxhole conversion. Uh, I had that when I arrived there, That's but cute. but but I ha I didn't have much tact, and I was ready to uh, convert the world, mm -hmm. and the truth is that they didn't want me on base. Mm -hmm. And so they gave me the one of the only uh, mobile crews we went out, but they gave me all the alcoholics of, of the group. And so I had about 15 guys, and we went all over to landing zones. I mean, uh, unending number of little stories I could tell you where we were sent into up and down the river that was a horrible trip up and down that river to Quavia. on the river. Oh yeah, in the boats getting down there with our material and getting back. I was the guy in the bottom of the boat 
shivering. <laughs> well, uh, and what was your assignments? Well, we we were uh, uh, one of the one of them. We were my crew and I were. Uh, I took my crew down to Quaviet, which is the northernmost base of any kind that we had in Vietnam. By the way, uh, to stop for a minute, uh, for editing, uh, not editing, yeah. but for clarification, Qua. I'm going to show you a map. C-U-A? C-U-A-V-I-E-T. Okay, Qua Viet. And Qua Viet. And of course Vietnamese pronounce all this differently than we do. But uh, I, I don't know. It'd be worth holding this up just to get it on here. And there, Can you see that pretty good? There, uh -huh. there is a map with where our base was, where Quaviet right. was. That helps. And Quezon, my unit was involved in Quezon. I was not there, but it was part of my unit that uh, survived all of that major, up there. Major, major right. operation. But the whole northern area, the I-Corps had uh, if I remember the statistics right, about two and a half times more casualties than any of the other uh, core areas. And I don't know, that might have been because we had more up there, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it was Closer to it was dangerous. And when I first got there, they were only sending us up for six months and they'd pull us back out. But uh, I ended up spending a full year. Full year yeah. in that particular right. area. So we, went to, yeah, so we went out to Quaviet uh, and uh, I've got some funny stories that happened there, and uh, then we were down in Qua Old Con Quang Tri City, which is an old French compound, and then out to several uh, landing zones, LZ Nancy. Uh, we were building outhouses that were prefabricated up in Dong Ha and brought down brought down Route One, and there were combination uh, showers and toilets. And in that case, we were doing them for the army down there, which was a little unusual. But the little humor in this was, I had had my crew out for a couple months. We had grown beards, which you weren't supposed to do in Vietnam. And we were just filthy, dirty. We'd been all over everywhere. And the, they had pr uh, brought the prefabricated uh, outhouses and showers down. And they were all bailed up out there, and we were a uh, little army uh, officer came out when we got in there late in the afternoon. And said, "How many of those are you going to get up before you quit today?" <laughs> and I said, "We're not going to put any up because my crew needs to rest." And he just got all indignant, and he went unknown to me. He went back up and called on the phone back up to Dong Ha, and complained to my commanding officer. And about an hour later, we we're only talking 20 miles, I see a dust cloud. And I look, and it's a Jeep, and it gets closer, and it's going full speed. And it goes, and it comes right through, and a trail of dust, and a CB emblem on it, and a 30 caliber machine gun, they go, didn't even wave, it went right by me. And I thought, man, that's interesting, that's from my unit. And I saw my commanding officer going around like two batty hens with the little army officer that had uh, told us to put up two before we quit that night. And he came back and stopped and just long enough to say, I told him that you will put them up when you want to put them up and if he messes with you one more time, we're going to load him up and take him down to the Marine Corps. <laughs> <laughs> this support system. And it didn't matter if he was a commanding, uh, it didn't matter if he was a commanding officer of that base or nothing. CBs kind of operated independently, and I know it was against all form and order, but uh, we had the goods, and therefore we had the leverage to That's power. to make those kind of deals. Yes. Yeah. You think he got the message? <laughs> I think he did because we had no problem after that. We put up probably eight or nine, made their whole lifestyle a lot better there on that little fire base. And he had to eat crow. <laughs> he ate humble crow because he I never saw him again. <laughs> he didn't come out. <laughs> well, you're talking about Highway One. You're talking about the river. Yes. Now that's not friendly territory. No, uh, uh, the Quaviat River uh, was uh, 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 it was the northernmost river on our side of the DMZ and runs parallel with it. And uh, to get up and down that river, of course, we had Navy 
uh, Fleet Navy boats, gunboats in there, and there, it was quite heavily traveled, but always dangerous and always risking a lot to get down and back. Another little funny story that uh, uh, we would order supplies out of uh, Da Nang and they would ship them up and bring them in on big ships there in Quaviat and rough terrain forklifts down across the beach and bring it out. But we figured if we got half of what we ordered, we were lucky because the rest of it was stolen by the Army, the Marines, the Air Force, and of course everything we thought belonged to the military so but still we pilfered and we would uh, we and I mean stealing from each other was a yeah, huge it on. was a huge part of that whole year or bargaining or trading <laughs> I mean we would trade for boxes of filet mignon steak and uh, mm. another little humorous story there in Quaviette we had been without uh, soda pop and beer for about two months and the first shipment came in on a big LST that was on the beach front doors opened up and the CBs unloaded all of this we had rough terrain forklifts go down across the beach dangerous because you're out there a setting duck and they would go in and put three or four pallets up come back across the sand and then uh, and put it down come back well one of our forklifts unloading came back and it was about four or five pallets deep of soda pop and it tipped over and now what are you going to do uh, the marine the army saw it and the marines saw it and they're running down the beach they're going to grab it and down on this end we had earth movers that you know big they drop you know we were doing something up there to move earth around and we looked out there and we saw the army coming look like look like fleas coming across the beach to get that spilt soda pop and we whistled at the, our earth mover and he turned saw it came barreling down there and just before all the army and marines got there he dropped his blade scooped it all up and we had all that free soda pop that we stored it everywhere and bartered, used it to barter from there on out for different power. things. Yes, power. Power over soda. Power. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, you're recording this. Now, you talked about filet mignon, and someone's going to listen to this. And oh, but it was bad filet mignon. <laughs> the government, when they contracted, they got, they got, they got, they got, they uh, got, uh, taken advantage of. It was filet mignon, but it was full of gristle. It was just not the best. It was the lowest grade filet mignon on the planet. Now you saved grace on that one. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Oh boy. So, uh, um, so how was your little, how were you, you, you described your uh, hooch. How were you fed? What kind of food? Good uh, question, and uh, our base at, uh, and later on I was transferred to Quang Tri uh, Combat Base, which was about six miles south. It was out of range of the Vietnamese mortar and rockets that was coming across the DMZ, but we had a lot of problems on the perimeter, a whole different story, a whole different setting. But down there, uh, we did not have our own uh, mess hall facilities, but we had another CB camp next to us, which was larger, and they were one of the ones that moved in and out. And so we would walk over there to for our meals. Truth is, I very rarely did it. We would find food and keep it in the hooch, or we would be getting food sent to us from home. I'm to this day burnt out on beanie weenies. I can't even look at one. How about spam? <laughs> Our uh, spam. We had a little bit of it, but uh, and then talking about sea rations. I mean, we would go through a case of them just to get what we wanted out of them. And you, and you would take the good candy bars and the fruit, and maybe one or two other things, and two thirds of it would just get. Uh, actually, we would uh, give it away to the army. Uh, no, to to the kids on the road up and down between on highway one we would uh, uh, give it 
uh, to the kids. And speaking of kids, villagers, did you have much contact with the Vietnamese civilians? We were not supposed to have any contact at all, but uh, we met, my, I met with my crew an amazing, uh, and I wish I could find out what happened to, uh, to Dai. He was an interpreter for the Arvin, uh, 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 Arvins up there in Quang Tri. And against rules, on one Sunday, myself and about two others uh, went off the base and were invited to his house for a Vietnamese dinner in Quang Tri. And I remember clearly that because we were served about eight different courses of food, Vietnamese food. His wife cooked it, just the men ate. And the main uh, uh, entree of this was duck, cooked duck. The whole duck, feet, head, everything. And uh, I remember you had to pick off the meat and all this. But Di would come by the base frequently, and I love this guy. Uh, and I've always wondered what would happen to him. I've got his business card, but unfortunately his last name is like Smith in Vietnamese. And uh, I became good friends with him and I've always wondered what happened to him. But anyway, so we mostly ate in our hooches and uh, on this case we got out for that one meal. Uh, were you losing weight? Did you feel energy, nourishment? I don't, th we lost weight because of the heat, because when summer came, I've got pictures of us going in the convoys up round one during the monsoons at, through three feet of water and just rivers flowing over Route 1 and uh, uh, and it was just horribly hot. We'd mount a fan right over our head and of course the bugs there were horrible. We'd have bug nets, but there were so many of them, there'd be two, three pounds of bugs waiting your 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 uh, net down that you had over your your cot every night. I mean, they had bugs that were that long, and they were the, I don't know what they called them, but they were black and they had horns on them. Mm. And when they flew, they had pink wings. And if one of them had ever landed on me, it would have been <laughs> over, dead. They had praying mantises that had fuselages on them like that. <laughs> And oh I mean, I have never seen bugs like we had bugs over there. And, and, uh, kind of in the tropical humidity. It was everything, but where the GIs were, we scraped it off. Mm -hmm. And on that hot sand down in Quang Tree, it'd get up 120 real easy. How about malaria? Any issues of the malaria? We took malaria pills. They were big, big round things. I don't remember anybody getting malaria, but we were given malaria pills. Mandated? Yes, I was supposed to take them. Mm -hmm. Another little funny story, which you remind me yes. of, they had uh, this dreaded shot called the Gumaglobin shot, the GG shot. And I'm not sure what it protected you against, but they did not give me one before I got there. And somehow, in Da Nang, before I got up north, I had talked my way out of it, or got out of it. But I ended up pers talking my way out of ever getting that dreaded GG shot the entire time I was there. But That's pretty slick, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know how I did it, but I never got one. Well, I don't know. You missed it that day. <laughs> but uh, uh, mail. How about mail from home? Back and forth. Is that regular? Mail was was uh, regular and appreciated and looked forward to and it made your day. It, uh, it was everything. Yeah. And again, I wrote home, I think my dad kept track, uh, if I remember right, 122 letters, which I still have them Great. in a box. But the spelling was so bad in them that I don't want anybody to see them. <laughs> it's the substance. Yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, you uh, you were in that region then for the full year. Did you could you take any R and Rs? Did you take R and R? The, they gave us one out of country R and R and two in country R and Rs. I I did not take advantage of the in country R and Rs at all because all they did was fly you down to Da Nang uh, for 
four or five days and it just wasn't of interest to me and I was afraid of those flights back and forth and I thought I'm just it was uh, my own wanting to just not expose myself to anything however it reminds me of another story <laughs> but uh, but we I did fly off and see my wife at the time in Hawaii and it was an amazing wonderful trip I'd left my crew at Quaviet and uh, then came back up river, then down to Nanang, and then to Honolulu, Hawaii. And it but was coming, leaving Honolulu. Coming back was tough, right? tough, tough, because tough, you had half your half your uh, uh, tour left. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and I do have to ask this question: Your letters home were pretty superficial. I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, no, they. Uh, some of them were were fairly detailed, and others were just routine. Most of it was complaining about uh, wanting to be home and missing home, and just a diatribe of homesickness all the time. I mean, it was just nauseating when I read them now. I mean, I mean, just uh, you wrote the same thing every day. Well, sure. I want to come home. <laughs> uh, natural, totally. Uh, I and another tough question: Did you lose any of your buddies? I did not <coughs> lose any of my <coughs> direct buddies mm -hmm. at all. Uh, we had a number of Purple Hearts within our group, uh, but the answer is I did not. And luckily. And supplies were sufficient? Supplies were always as sufficient, except when we ran out of Coca-Cola for about two months. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any injury to you at all? Uh, well, I, I guess I got a, uh, I had an injury, and I've got a picture of me <laughs> with gauze and all a thumb that's blooded out, and in the shop in Quang Tree, I had a 16 penny nail set in a truss, and somehow I left my thumb on the top of that nail, and I hit it with a hammer, mm. and it just completely. Okay. filleted my big thumb and that was my war injury. <laughs> okay. that's, that's excellent. That's an excellent report. <laughs> uh, did you have uh, did you have any access to like Bob Hope, USO? Good question. Uh, they did not fly the big names up to our area. Uh, we uh, well, that just rem you, you helped me remember something I didn't remember. We had a lot of USO tours up there, but they were small groups, and we were up in a very uh, hot area. And but the big names did not uh, did not uh, did not come up there. But I I did take one of those in country R and Rs. I forgot until you mentioned it. I was down in Da Nang, and Bob Hope was there, and I went to one. But there were several thousands of people, and you look like a, 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 a very miniature up there. Describe but, that. but what? But I can tell you exactly when it was. Yeah. Uh, he flew in the day after New Year's Day, after the day after the Rose Bowl, with Woody Hayes who had been in the Rose Bowl the day before and got out and got on an airplane no. and came to Vietnam. And I saw Bob Hope and Woody Hayes. Ohio State coach. Yes. And they were there on January 2nd. Uh, they came immediately after that Rose Bowl game. and uh, But there were thousands of us. And, uh, and but the question was, was Raquel there? <laughs> Might have been. I don't know. <laughs> I don't Raquel? remember. I oh don't gosh. know. I should have. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, I have to ask, my memory was at the end of that show, mm -hmm. Anita Bryant singing Silent Night, Holy Night. I don't know if she was on that tour. Yep. You could hear a pin drop. Yes, I, I I don't remember much about it except the, the massive crowd and they're being so small and I remember Woody Hayes. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> and Bob was great. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and, amazing. Yeah. I forgot all about that. Yeah. Thank you. No, that's fantastic <laughs> that you had yeah. that experience. Um, well, uh, now the second half of your tour was uh, was the biggest battle at that one time. 
and then was it just the constant mortaring mm -hmm. in, in and out? The, the worst part was the first half. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a group of our uh, uh, of my unit, CBMU 301, in Quezon, which they just, the, uh, the, the, the ordeal up there was just a massacre. It was just horrible. They would fly them down, and I remember, in fact, we were, the, they asked for volunteers, you, 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 and you, and they stopped one from me from going up there. But those guys, I remember one guy from Hawaii, that he was down for a couple of days in Dong Ha, and they were flying him back, and he was just crying. Mm -hmm because it was just horrible in Quezon. Uh, what would they be doing up there? Well, they were uh, maintaining the airstrip, the runways, uh, and all of the maintenance of Quezon. Our CBs did that. And Art, a typical day, how many hours? How many hours out there? And uh, did you do any of the airstrips, or are you doing other mm -hmm. things? I did not do any of the airstrips, actually. I was not on that crew. Uh, again, my crew, uh, we went all over. Uh, most of the crews stayed right on the base. But uh, I built a bank vault one time to hold military pay certificates. Uh, a lot of outhouses. Uh, somebody had to do it. <laughs> I made life easier for everybody. And, uh, and uh, uh, just you name it, we did it. Well, you mentioned your fatigue. Oh, it was just tough. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, I thought we worked ten-hour days. We did get. Uh, I don't know if we got the full day off on Sunday, but at least half the day. But it was staying busy. I, I, there was no complaints about it. It kept you busy, and if you were busy, it kept your mind off things. And staying clean. You said you were just so filthy at that one time, <laughs> but. Uh, Keeping your clothes clean. This red dirt up there would get into everything. Everything you wore. All the olive drab green looked uh, reddish. And uh, we, we had good... CBs had the best. I mean, we had washing machines. We had all of that. Because you had the power. We had ice machines. We, uh, If anybody had ice, we had it. And... Uh, and and uh, for, from that part, uh, we had good support because we had access to uh, almost everything we needed. And Art, can you describe when America goes to war, the logistics of going to war, everything to think about? Well, it is. And uh, again, uh, not to get into the politics of it, but we lost 55,000 men over there. And uh, and uh, some wonder if the event that they think triggered it even happened. Uh, but I know that those of us that went, we worked at it to the best of our ability, and we felt that we were defending America. Did you you and I want you yes uh, I want to expand on that because that's an important mm -hmm. point. You really okay. Well, we were there representing our country, and regardless of politics and politicians and stupid things that they do, and even the very reason for even being there or not being there, we did our best day in and day out, and uh, there was a—I mean, it was—it was patriotic. Yes, it was. No bones about it. And you would say the vast majority of you felt that. The vast majority. I do not remember seeing drugs used one time at all that entire year. I didn't hear anybody was using them. Nobody got caught with them. And I have a theory on that. Because I believe that, in my mind, that problem was at the end of the war. And my group that came in were there ahead of the drug culture. And I believe after we left in 69, from 69 through 72, that that, that drug culture became a problem there. But I can tell you that I saw none of it, not even once, and I was street smart. Mm -hmm. If it were there, I would have seen it, yep. but I didn't hear about and it. And that's quite a statement to make for this video. Mm -hmm. It really is. Mm -hmm. It's an important mm -hmm. statement to make, yeah. A historical statement to make. 
Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. So, um, so could I assume that the morale remained high because of this? Uh, the morale was high in my group. Mm -hmm. We were proud to be Seabees. We were proud to be over there. We were proud to be uh, supporting the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. And uh, even on our uh, Vietnam service uh, pin, we are authorized to wear the Marine emblem mm -hmm. because uh, we did the combat with the Marine Corps up there. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very interesting comments. Yeah. Well, Art, uh, it's coming toward the end of your tour over there. Uh, did you have like the last 30 days or how did that come <laughs> <out>? <laughs> Well, the last 30 days uh, you become more and more uh, paranoid. Uh, you always hear the stories of somebody that didn't make it uh, to get out of the place and, uh, and, and that actually did happen a number of times. but. Uh, I was in Quang Tri, which is about six miles south of Dong Ha, the combat base there. And uh, we, there were a lot of things that happened down there I haven't even talked about. We had a run on the perimeter, we had sappers in the camp, da 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 da. But at the end, uh, you just wanted to get home. You just wanted to get home. Play it safe. Play it safe. And. Uh, did you have a helmet with the calendar? Uh, I, I, no, I didn't. I had a calendar, but it wasn't on the helmet. But I, I just I had forgotten all about that. But we did some stupid things down there, too. We in Quang Tri once, back in when we were there, we decided we wanted to go swimming in the ocean. So we took off on the weekend, two or three trucks with hardly any, any uh, security. Oh, my. And went out t through nowhere, out to the ocean, and went swimming and came all the way back and we had just little old M16s which are nothing and I looked back on it and I thought man that was about stupid to do that uh, but we but we made it yeah. and uh, but we went swimming in the South China Sea because we took the time to do it. Was it worth the experience? Uh, to say now that I did it yes <laughs> but uh, but we you know there were other trucks blown up along the way and I mean it was just <laughs> crazy stupid Oh boy. <laughs> uh, oh, but anyway, yeah. last 30 days. Yes. <laughs> so we get down to coming home. And of course, uh, uh, I remember flying back with uh, uh, one of the lieutenants that was over us. His last name was Sorensen. And I just found out he is still alive and he's up in the Great Lakes area. But uh, there were little, there wasn't a lot of friendship between the enlisted and the officers and uh, they were they're were great but uh, you know there just wasn't a mix but I, re I re always remember him he was on the same airplane mostly Marine Corps and we got home and we landed as soon as that plane landed in Norton Air Force Base without rehearsing there was a roaring cheer yeah. that you were on the ground yeah. and uh, yeah. and anyway he, he got out, and I, I'll always remember it. He said, Moore, take care of yourself. And you did. And uh, you sure did. I've never forgot that comment. Yeah, what a simple statement. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so your homecoming was okay because you were on a base. Well, we landed on the base. My, uh, my wife and my parents were there, but I walked right off the base. Uh, I didn't spend any time at all. Was that the end of your... That, no, no. Uh, I had another assignment. Okay. Uh, it was far worse in Vietnam. It was Philadelphia. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't. But that's where I drew. And I was glad to get to Philadelphia, believe me. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and probably running a little bit out of time. Okay. We're, we're still okay. Yeah. Yeah. So... Oh. The support, how, much longer, the, how much longer in Philadelphia? The support from the family was great. I want to say that I did not myself receive any bad statements or anything from anybody. I know a lot of the guys went to bigger cities. I felt support in my town. And, and all that I've read about, I believe, happened. But it, I don't believe that it happened. I didn't see it any uh, I, uh, directly. I have, well, that's yeah. that's a, Good. That's a good report. Yeah. But I have to ask you, when you first saw your family, oh my off goodness! That plane, well, I had a brand new 1965, 66 uh, 
Holes Cutlass Super Sport and uh, my wife and the family had supported me wonderfully that whole year uh, while I was over there. Now, but uh, then we went on to Philadelphia, but I had a lot of problems later that uh, ended up getting me here to the Tri-Cities many years later and just in a crash condition. But, uh, but... Uh, now, do you mind just saying yeah. how, why Tri-Cities? Well, I came back. I was a clergyman my, when I got back. I went through college and I pastored three churches. Really? And, uh, but had a real crash and burn in, in the last church I pastored in Oakdale, California. And um, I threw everything away. I just threw it out. I threw the family. I threw... I threw it all away. I was out on the street. I had no PTSD. Well, I went through it years later, and they say it was, but yeah, I'm still in my mind wondering if it was. It was PTSD of some sort, mm -hmm. because I threw it all away. I was just done. I was down. Kind of a delayed gone. response. It was, mm -hmm. and uh, and so I ended up in the Tri Cities here, in 1992, with a dog, a pickup truck a trailer and a divorce and I didn't know what planet I was on but it works out I, I got a, had a real estate license and I was so afraid of failure that I sold and closed 50 homes my first year in the business and ended up owning my own real estate company here in town and then 20 years ago I met an amazing lady from Morocco and North Africa and she had been in charge of all the university scholarships for her whole country. Her dad was a two-time Olympian. And and uh, I'd been single about nine years, and she's the most amazing thing that happened to me. And we've, been we've been married 20 years. Ah, oh, that's a and, great story. Uh, and she's just gold. That's a great story. And, uh, and it's worked out. Great story. And I'm back being a clergyman again. You did? Yes, for the last nine years, but uh, we don't take any money from the church, uh, and uh, we're back doing that, and also work with hospice, a lot of neat things, uh, about doing a lot of volunteer work, and we recognize veterans when they are in their last days using the No Veteran Dies Alone program, recognize their service. I bring all the other veterans out, and it's working out. And it's a win for them, a win for their family, a win for the veterans that participate in it. Great, great ongoing story. Yes. Not over yet. Great, great ongoing. Yeah. And would you mention your wife's name? Lamia. Okay. And she is from Morocco. She's a correctional sergeant at uh, Two Rivers in Oregon State Prison. She owns all the guns in my house. I am a man of peace. <laughs> and uh, an amazing lady that has... Uh, uh, sure sounds like that I could it. brag on for a long time. Wow, <laughs> that's uh, just a uh, just a wonderful story. Well, wrapping things up, then, uh, do you be obviously you belong to some military organizations socially mm. or like VFW or? Uh, you know, I'm a part of the American Legion. However, I don't ever go to any meetings over there. I uh, uh, we had a CB group here until recently, and then it. Uh, unfortunately disbanded because we couldn't get enough out but uh, I am involved primarily with hospice here in town and I run the program that recognizes the military service of the veterans that are in their last days. Great. Fabulous. Wonderful. I love that. Um, well, is there anything that I missed or that you would like to add to your story? When I walk out of here, I will remember a dozen things. <laughs> and me too. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. And thank you, Red Cross, for thank, doing this. Thank you, Art Moore, yeah. uh, for this yeah. one. Vic, anything? Have there been any reunions? Uh, I, uh, ha my unit had several of them, and I did not go to them because I, I just wasn't ready. Which brings on another quick last story. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, I did go down to a CB reunion, but it was for all units and really enjoyed it. Uh, but uh, uh, I, my group, uh, my unit got together a couple years ago and was going back to Vietnam to where we were. 
I had the money, the time, and everything, and I turned it down. And what ruined it for me was simply a funny thing. I looked on Google Earth, and I looked along that airstrip in Quang Tri, where I almost lost my life a few times. I looked up at Dong Ha, and, and along Quang Tri there, darned if there wasn't a Burger King sitting right there. And I'm thinking to myself, what on earth were we over there for if there's a Burger King right where we were at and 55,000 people Blood, sweat, and were, were dead? Yeah. I mean, and there we are. I mean, yeah. and just, so I didn't go. And I still would like to go, and I'd like to take my wife or my kids with me, and, uh, and, 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 but I, I would do it. But that did ruin that trip for me. Yeah, I thought, no look at all that. Well, you would have to anticipate a lot of different, I'm hearing the high rises and the five stars. Oh, yeah, and it's, 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 it's uh, modernized, yeah. yeah. And uh, very, very quickly, and we'll, we'll uh, end it there, but uh, if you'll name your children's names. Uh, Ryan uh, is the youngest, and he is living in San Juan Capistrano mm -hmm. and uh, doing extremely well in his business. And uh, I have a son that has been a principal of a high school over in Temecula, California. And, uh, and then I have a daughter that, uh, that uh, they all have gone to college. But my daughter has done for many years. She's been an excellent Starbucks barista in and, 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 and over uh, in the uh, Seattle area. And that's Cinda. Cinda, Keith, and Ryan. And they will very much appreciate your interview. And my ex-wife, Diane, she is to be appreciated as well. And I wanted to say that. Very good. Excellent. Thank you for this very interesting interview, and how else to say thank you and welcome home? How well, else to say it? Well, thank you for this recognition. Yeah.